Welcome to Wellness Unplugged, where we disconnect the fake glitz of social media and get real about creating that transformation you've been wanting for far too long. You'll hear real and raw conversations with experts in nutrition, fitness, health, and psychology. We're not here to dish the latest overpriced supplement, miracle cure, or fad diet. There's enough shows like that. We're all about science. This is a journey to be walked one step at a time. We'll get healthier together by simplifying nutrition, building on our previous successes, and changing habits, behaviors, and mindset just a little bit every day. So if you're ready to confront your challenges head on and get back to feeling like you're in control of your life again, then you're in the right place. Now, your host of Wellness Unplugged, down over 100 pounds, and is still on a mission to help you leave BS diets in the rear view mirror forever. Coach John McLernan. All right. Welcome to Wellness Unplugged. We're back with Toby Pasman, who is a neurophysiology researcher, founder of applied neuroscience company that utilizes neurotech. This stuff sounds really fancy, by the way, uh, including QEEG. We're going to figure out what that means. Brain mapping, EEG, neurofeedback, and tra- transcranial stimulation. That's a bit of a mouthful. So we're going to have to dive into what, th- what that actually means. Um, his goal here is to drastically improve people's mental health and help them achieve optimal cognitive performance. Um, Toby has a master's of psychology and is a board certified QEEG brain mapping and EEG neurofeedback practitioner and is currently working on becoming an accredited, accredited human potential coach. Okay, that's a lot of big words. <laughs> Indeed. All right, welcome, Toby, man. It's awesome to have you here. It's great to be here, John. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so um, I'd like to start with just what what got you wanting to study this stuff? Um, what, you know, that this, because to the, the average listener, they hear all these big, big terms and it sounds super fancy. Um, you know, what, what got you here? Sure. Um, so I, I was always just kind of uh, a very curious kid, I would say. You know, I was always thinking about my own thinking, thinking about why I'm doing the things that I'm doing or why other people are the way they are. I was always just questioning everything. Yeah. And I feel like that questioning led into, you know, taking some psychology classes while I was an undergraduate, while I didn't have any clue what I wanted to do. You know, I was a business major and suffering through those hour and 50 (laughs) minute lectures. Like, yeah, yeah. So I ended up taking a biopsychology class that like blew my mind as far as like learning about the biological basis of how the brain actually functions on a chemical and electrical level and learning that we can actually do a really good job of measuring the electrical side of brain activity through a technology that you briefly mentioned, which is an EEG, or it can be a a QEEG. That's just a, a different way to visualize that data but it's basically the electrical rhythms uh, that from the brain that we're actually able to record with this device and then i started kind of like working at an eeg lab in my at my university and that was all fascinating but i got really curious like okay we're measuring this stuff we're like assessing and, and measuring what someone's brain is is doing electrically but i didn't know that there was actually this whole world of neuromodulation or neurotherapy which is what is basically using neurotechnologies to actually alter the eeg and actually regulate the brain's electrical activity so So that's yeah if we're we're gonna create a visual for people maybe you've seen a picture uh, if i have this right of someone wearing like one it looks like a helmet with a whole bunch of like wires and and stuff attached to it Um, exactly a little bit like neo in the matrix but uh a a little fancier fancier than that with maybe not quite the same uh the same sci-fi potential there but you're you're measuring like what's actually happening in the brain and then it sounds like if i if i understand correctly you're then going to look at the brain again after maybe doing some activities or some therapies or things like that and measure again what's happening in the brain and see if you can identify areas that have positively changed exactly yeah so so with the eeg we're able to kind of look at the activity of the different electrical brain waves. So they're kind of divvied up based on their frequency. And so there's like the slowest of the brain waves. We have like Delta, which is really important for like deep restorative sleep, theta being kind of a bridge between the conscious and unconscious mind. 
usually found in like light sleep or yeah. deep, deep meditative states. We have like alpha, which is a bit faster and is kind of an idling rhythm of the brain. And then beta, which is kind of our, you know, what you and I are probably mostly producing right now What the listeners are probably producing just kind of paying attention to the show right now. So we're okay. able to basically assess all of those different brain waves and see whether your brain is producing either healthy quantities of them, whether it's overproducing or whether it's underproducing each of those different brain waves. And we're also able to tell which area of the brain that activity is occurring in. Okay. So it really gives us kind of a roadmap of, okay, you know, each person's brain, we each have a very unique neurophysiology. So it's like, you know, what a treatment approach that might work well for you might be something that might actually make my symptoms worse. So right, it's, okay. it's all about, yeah, kind of <clears throat> gauging where someone's, each person's at. So if we were to take this into the, the real world, uh, I say the real world, uh, again, just because the average listener is probably not a, a brain researcher and we say, okay, how or where would we use this? Um, you know, let's say, for example, I deal with anxiety and depression and I'm able to manage it through, through lifestyle without medication. I think I'm really fortunate in that regard, um, but I do experience it. Is that something that this type of therapy could do work on? Yeah, there's plenty of research that shows like the technologies that I work with that actually alter the, the EEG, such as like neurofeedback or neurostimulation that you mentioned in the intro. All of those uh, uh, technologies have really good research that supports that they are efficacious for a lot of different mental health, uh, psychiatric, along with neurological, uh, certain neurological conditions. Now, I have to be a little bit careful because I'm not a licensed psychologist. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm using these technologies in my business strictly for peak performance and wellness. Yeah. Okay. Despite, despite there being the technologies research on these specific conditions, I just have to change the terminology a little bit. So instead of, you know, I can't say, John, we're going to, we're going to be treating your depression today. You know, it got to be, all right, we're going to work to, we're going to be working to improve your mood or instead yeah. of reducing or working on your anxiety, we're <laughs> reducing your stress. So it's right. a bit of semantics, but it, it is right. Cause we, you know, we live in a litigious society where if you, if you make some sort of promise and uh, it doesn't work out as planned that someone might come after you and say, well, you didn't have the piece of paper with your name on it that says you're certified to specifically address that issue. Um, but I think, I think it's good to be aware that this is a possibility. The, the other question that comes up for me. So we have all, is this like four main categories of brain waves? Do I have that right? Yeah, there's also gamma brain waves, um, which are an important kind of fifth, uh, kind of a, I don't know if the ugly stepchild is the, I don't think, I don't think that's the right, right way to put it, but it's like, you know, usually like you'll, you'll see the, the four major brain waves talked about, but gamma is not to discredit gamma in any way. Gamma is, uh, kind it ex of, it exists binds, for a reason. It exists for a reason and binds together a lot of the other brain waves. And that's actually one of the things that in people have been meditating for really long periods of times, the, um, there was a, a researcher at, uh, this is, I believe the university of Wisconsin, Richie Davidson, who's a very well-known neuroscientist. He conducted a bunch of these brain scans using similar technologies that what I'm talking about, uh, looking at, uh, the brains of like Tibetan, uh, monks who'd been meditating for you know, for years and for often, you know, oftentimes yeah, like yeah. for hours each day. And they found like one of the really significant findings was greatly increased gamma activity in mm -hmm. these meditators. So researchers are still trying to figure out like exactly what that means as far as how their brain is, is different, say, than an average person's, but they're thinking that it's, you know, related to a, an ability to have kind of a greater awareness and make connections amongst things that you might otherwise not be able to connect. Right. So, um, and, and why, why I sort of steered towards the, the mental health discussion, uh, even though we did, we did put the caveat in there that you're not specifically necessarily addressing these, um, that somebody, somebody might be able to, um, use this technology. Uh, and why I think that sometimes there might be this, well, there is actually this primary focus when, let's say when someone's experiencing a mental health issue, um, the two main modalities that it's typically addressed with are medication and therapy. But I think there's this third potential modality where sometimes it's, you know, we're, we're looking at maybe 
very commonly to address like chemical or neurotransmitter imbalances in the brain. But here we're looking at maybe, could we say like a di actual like dysfunction of the brain, like the brain isn't functioning the way it should. Why I'm curious is because I, I worked with, uh, on my anxiety and depression with a chiropractic neurologist. And I, I have to be careful what I say, because uh, again, uh, litigation and all that kind of fun stuff. But one of the things that we did is he worked to increase activity in one part of my brain, the parietal lobe, um, because when I would be under experiencing anxiety, it would feel like I was floating out of my body. So we worked to increase activity in that part of my brain and then to stabilize the brain stem so my brain wouldn't be triggered as often. So I wouldn't have as many panic attacks. And so it wasn't it wasn't a medication based approach and it wasn't a therapy based approach. It was actually, here's these areas of your brain that are not functioning correctly. And if we can stabilize them and, and those two things, now that's not to discredit um, therapy and medication at all. They're very valuable and useful tools, but this, which I think is a really like untouched, maybe relatively untouched, or it's a new area. It's like discovering a new continent or something like that, where it's like, there's these other things that we could also address that maybe don't have the same, side effects and can produce some pretty cool results so uh like what you mentioned the term neurotherapy like what, what is neurotherapy neurotherapy i would define it as as utilizing these different kinds of neurotechnologies such as the brain mapping neurofeedback neurostimulation audio visual entrainment uh, using all of these different things to either enhance mental health or work on peak performance so yeah, it's, I would say it's, it's definitely a different approach as you've been talking about. And really, in my opinion, when you address kind of the biological basis of how the, you know, the, the, the electrical rhythms are kind of creating everything as far as, you know, our experience of the world, our, our thinking, our behavior, our, you know, ability to get deep restorative sleep, our energy levels, our mood, so much is tied to these electrical brain waves. So actually figuring out and assessing and then working to regulate the, uh, the electrical activity of the brain often kind of gets to the, the root of the issue in a way that, you know, a psychiatric medication might be able to kind of temporarily elevate levels of a certain neurotransmitter. But if you're mm -hmm. able to actually, you know, kind of dig deep and figure out, okay, well, if we can actually stabilize this, as you're talking about, stabilize, say, the parietal lobes then maybe there's not necessarily the need for an additional kind of medication. I would say yeah. with psychotherapy, I think there's great synergies in kind of use it, uh, utilizing neurotherapy and psychotherapy, kind of combining the two. Because yeah. when, when your brain functions uh, better biologically, it can be a lot easier to make some of these psychological changes. You know, if you're, you know, if you have more energy and are thinking more clearly and can sleep better, you're probably going to have more kind of reserves, more willpower to, you know, implement the other changes, working out Absolutely. and eating healthy and, and doing all the other things that are also going to, you know, including psychotherapy, working on whatever habits or. Yeah. And I think we should, even with the term therapy, I really would like to see this more normalized and I would, I, I would like to see us approach something like therapy as not as you only go there when you're broken, but you can actually go there because you want to optimize your brain health or, or your, your mental health. And so then I, cause I like to talk about brain driven weight loss. That's kind of, you know, I try to take a psychology based approach to working with people because everything, the brain is the driver of our behaviors. Obviously what we eat and how we move that affects our, our health and our weight and so on. But it's the brain. The brain is the control center. That's where all these urges and impulses and things are, are coming from. So there's this really cool term, neuroplasticity. And I like to say it like, it's kind of like the brain's ability to rewire itself. Because some people might feel like they're stuck or am I always going to be like this? So w what is neuroplasticity? Sure. And actually, I, I just wanted to comment on something that you just said before, uh, before getting into neuroplasticity. What you said about kind of uh, with with the brain, um, you know, not necessarily like, you know, people usually just seeking help when there's like a severe problem, right? Where it's like, you know, think of if you, you know, like like most people, healthy people go to the, you know, 
who, who pay attention to their health, go to the gym and lift weights. And, you know, when they're feeling good, right? Like if, yeah. if you were to have a shoulder injury, you might actually like take a few days off the gym, not, not go to the gym when you have the, the injury, but yeah. that's kind of the approach that we take, right. When it comes to like our mental health, we kind of ignore it yeah. until, until it becomes such a problem that we go to someone, hopefully some people just, you know, don't because of the stigma. But yeah. if people eventually make their way to someone, it's usually once they're doing so poorly, but what, you know, I think what I'm sort of suggesting, I think you have a similar message. It sounds like, which is like, you know, we can actually kind of boost the resilience, increase your reserves of the, you know, kind of your brain capacity. So, you know, you can improve and enhance an already hopefully well-functioning organ instead of yeah. just waiting for a disorder or disease to take place. So can something like, cause you talked about, I can talk about the brain waves. Can somebody like they, they obviously happen independently, like of our, of our conscious control, but is there a way that we could, um, consciously to a degree influence or control those brain waves? Cause you talked about like beta would be what, like the energy, like your, your higher functioning, that kind of thing. Whereas yeah. like, was it theta you said was like deep sleep? Uh, Delta Delta is really in charge of deep restorative sleep. Okay, beta kind of the bridge between the conscious and unconscious. Oh, right. Okay. And yeah, yeah, we can absolutely like that's the technology uh, and I'll, I'll tie in kind of your previous question to this of, of kind of neuroplasticity, basically being the brain's ability to actually change and reorganize itself, rewire itself on a chemical and electrical level. So because of this neuroplastic, like if there wasn't neuroplasticity, there'd be no neurotherapy or neuromodulation. Right. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. It'd be like, we're just stuck with the brains we have and we can't <laughs> yeah. do anything about it. But that's one of the, the beautiful things that researchers knew that there was neuroplasticity, but up until a few decades ago, they thought that it sort of just stopped as we reached adulthood yeah. and that we, you know, as we got older, you know, drank heavily, did drugs, our brain cells just kind of started dying off. <laughs> and it's like we, brain cells do die off. Like that is a true statement, but the the big breakthrough in the research was that new brain cells are actually also forming across our entire adult lifespan and this neuroplasticity is taking place so that's we're super not cool. yeah so because of that we're not stuck with the brains we have and we can absolutely um to some degree consciously control and change our brain waves uh, the technology that comes to mind is is neurofeedback uh, as far as that's Neurostimulation is kind of a more direct, we're just kind of in training the brain to create whatever rhythm we're, we're doing. Right. Yep. Whereas neurofeedback is more so uh, teaching the brain. It's not, it's not inputting anything into the brain. It's simply, you know, you'd have one of these EEG caps, what you're mentioning earlier, like the swim cap looking thing, we'd have that on your head. And then you're basically playing a video game with your mind. And so for instance, oh, that's so actually instance, really cool. <laughs> it is really cool. Yeah. So for instance, like say if the feedback is, is visual, you might see the screen get larger as you're producing more of the desired brainwave. Okay. The screen might then get smaller if you deviate from that healthy brainwave production. So say, you know, say we have someone who struggles with inattention and is, you know, having real difficulties staying focused. And then we also see deficits in, in the beta brain wave, which is one of those that's really important for focus and concentration. So then we could actually put someone on a neurofeedback protocol where we're rewarding them whenever their brain produces more beta activity. So they would see, you know, the screen get larger, or if it was like audio feedback, you'd hear the tones get louder. Okay. So that's kind of telling the brain, okay, great job. You know, you're doing well. And then when that, feedback is removed when the tones get quieter the the screen gets smaller that's like the negative feedback saying like oh no no you know go back to whatever you're doing okay to get that reward so, so hence be, the feedback oh sorry yeah. can this be used for like a you know add or adhd oh is it that is kind of, yeah that's okay. actually neurofeedback that's kind of that where it got its start being used in in adhd and it's still that's that's one of the most efficacious treatments for adhd then because then my mind goes to safety because of course this is a relatively new technology you know things like maybe maybe psychiatric treatments and drugs have been around for a very very long time this is kind of new 
and this sounds like a crazy like science fiction question, but could could someone, you know, when they put this cap on your head, like do nefarious things, you know, change your brain, you know, brainwash you or things like that? Not to the degree that I think you're you're speaking of, but you can you can definitely make someone worse with neurofeedback okay. in the sense that say th- this is why it's so important that I encourage listeners who are you know working with neurofeedback or interested in starting like that you find someone with the adequate like credentials and experience because you are kind of like letting someone sort of be in charge of kind of your you know the functioning of your brain. So it's, it's, it's something that that's why I think it's so important that the initial brain map is, you know, is done so that we're able to actually see, okay, here, here are the problematic brain waves here. Here's what the problem actually is. We're seeing too much activity or too little activity in these specific brain waves and in these specific regions of the brain. Okay. So if you didn't do that and you were to just say, all right, you know, let's, Let's work to enhance someone's beta activity with neurofeedback. You might help someone who suffers from d- issues with focus and inattention, but you could potentially actually worsen someone if someone is coming in with like a lot of like anxiety and OCD, ruminative right. thoughts. They're already kind of in that hyper driven focus state. You could actually make that individual worse because they're okay. probably, they might be producing plenty of beta waves on their own. They might need to be on a more relaxing protocol that would probably help them the best. So that's why I say it's like, if if you don't do the initial brain map, you're kind of just shooting in the dark and you could potentially make someone worse. Okay. And I think that's really, really important to know. So then uh, a little bit of a side question, because people, let's say they might try and do something like binaural beats, for Mm -hmm. example, and and you can get binaural beats that are different, you know, theta, beta, alpha, whatever to try and, I don't know, make you more energized or make you more focused or help you sleep. Do, do binaural beats work and can they have, you know, a positive and or negative effect if people are sort of trying to, could we say self-medicate with them? Right. I, I think it's, it's a tricky sort of debate. I, I absolutely have read a lot of re- there's real science behind binaural beats. They absolutely do work. What I've been asked about before and what I've seen myself is, you know, people finding these like YouTube videos that are like, you know, stimulate a 363 hertz, you know, yeah, yeah. that's that's going to heal your cells or whatever. And it's like, I don't necessarily believe that like what is actually on these YouTube videos is binaural beats. There, right. there are certain companies that actually have like developed real legitimate binaural beats, but what you're, what people are finding. I feel like when, when I get asked about binaural beats is usually like these YouTube videos and yes, I don't, yeah, I don't, I, maybe some of them work, maybe some of them don't, but yeah, I can't really speak on, on that, but the technology in itself, the, the, you can entrain the electrical rhythms of the brain through the ears. Uh, That is something that that is plausible and is something that I actually work with a, a, similar technology called audio visual entrainment okay where it's 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 not exactly like binaural beats but it's very similar where we're pulsing a specific frequency of light to the eyes and then a specific uh, tone frequency of tones into the ears <laughs> that sounds so super cool actually it is yeah so so it it's it's just another way to kind of influence the brain to produce you know more or less of a, a brain wave uh, kind of depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. So, a um, couple things come to mind. Uh, so, for example, like I was a binge eating food addict. Uh, I had sort of urges and impulses that were really difficult to regulate and control. And I, I did manage to eventually overcome this through a, a lot of struggling, a lot of trial and error, um, work with qualified coaches and therapists, and so on. Could the process of something like that, let's say, um, and maybe I'm asking something outside of your scope, but could could something a condition like that be potentially improved or make more improvement at a more rapid pace with something like that if you included like neurotherapy as a part of your mm-hmm. treatment? I think a hundred percent. I mean, there's there's certain signatures that would show up uh, on on a brain map. I can't say for for sure, you know, because each person's brain's a bit different. But 
you know, when you, when you take something like, you know, binge eating where you're having the cravings, you know, it's, it's similar to other cravings, you know, for other addictive drugs, or, I mean, you know, it's, it's similar brain processes that are involved. So what we would likely see is a lot of beta wave overproduction, like a, a production of these very high frequency beta brain waves that are linked to those sort of obsessions and ruminations and, and maybe cravings for food that if we work to kind of calm the nervous system, that could definitely be aided. And okay. they, they know things just like, you know, on a chemical side of things, like they know serotonin, like low levels of serotonin contribute <clears throat> to food cravings. Right. So yeah. food will actually like carbohydrates can actually boost serotonin levels up in the brain. Right. So, which is probably why people crave carbs. Exactly. So it's yeah. like if we address, you know, we, we, we know that if we address, like say that with, with either supplements like 5-HTP or saffron or, you know, St. John's wort, there's some different ones that can boost serotonin. Um, it's also how like the traditional say SSRI antidepressants are, are working on. But I think that's just a good example that we can definitely make a dent in, in those sort of cravings uh, if we're addressing kind of what's, what's going on in the brain, because that's what's obviously driving, you know, those, those cravings to take place. Wow. That's super cool. And I, I have like tons more questions, but we're, the, the clock is ticking in. So I have a couple of questions that maybe we can get almost like a rapid fire answer to. Sure. Um, so somebody wants to improve their brain health. What are some foods that they can eat that, that are research back that this will improve your brain performance? I would say, you know, what might be the most important thing is, is actually a food not to eat, which is to remove sugar because sugar is going to be the, the biggest like kryptonite when it comes to brain performance. That's so, interesting. As far as what you should eat though, definitely lots of uh, good quality fats. Fats have been neglected for a long time and sort of the nutrition space, but we know that the brain is actually made up a lot of fat. The myelin sheaths that kind of insulate the neurons are composed of fat and need this like healthy fat, say from, you know, fish and, you know, um, you know, meat, we can get this or eggs, uh, mm. butter, coconut oil, all of those sort of healthy fats are like the, the foundation. It sounds like you're, you're, um, not, 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 not promoting, but the, the keto di keto diet, which sometimes can be taken to a little bit, maybe too extreme because carbohydrates, I believe carbohydrates do have value, but it sounds yes. like there, there's something to it because some people who do follow say a ketogenic type diet often talk about their, they feel like their brain is functioning a little more clearly. And ketosis actually, so, so the brain actually prefers ketones compared to glucose in general as, as a fuel source. So it's actually going to be a more kind of, you could, you could think of it as like, you know, putting in the premium gasoline compared to the regular, it's going to, you know, sort of, it's, it's a more clean burning fuel. I would say when you're, uh, when you're burning fat, which you could either do from like fasting or just eating a very like high fat kind of ketogenic sort of diet um, where your brain's actually able to use a much better fat source or met, much better fuel source as in fat compared to carbs. So that triggers another question because, you know, I've heard this, that, you know, the brain prefers ketones, but, and, and maybe my, not really a rebuttal, but my question then is, because if we give our, our brain glucose and ketones to choose from, what will the brain choose? Well, it needs a certain amount of glucose. So he's like, okay. like with it, yeah, then that's like, you can't run off zero carbs forever. Like that's okay. going to cause yeah. problems. We need a certain level of glucose, but it's just that we consume way too many carbs <laughs> yeah, than yeah. we need. You know, yeah. people are able to do sustain these ketogenic diets where they're eating like hardly any carbs for long periods of times. And I think that kind of illustrates just like that there is a need for carbs, but it is much smaller than, you know, needing to eat pizza and bread and yeah, yeah. pasta for every single meal. Right. Yeah. We, we, we live in a very, very carb abundant uh, society. Yes. So then very quickly, what forms of exercise? So physical exercise, can that improve our brain health as well? Yes. So there's a, a key protein called BDNF, which is a yeah. brain derived neurotrophic factor. And that's something that actually increases neuroplasticity and contributes to neurogenesis, which is the creation 
of actually new brain cells and new connections amongst those cells. And one of the best ways you can trigger that is through certain forms of exercise. So I've seen like uh, with high intensity interval training along with uh, sprints, which I guess is maybe you could lump that into that category mm-hmm. or, you know, where you're basically doing these short bursts and giving your, your muscles like this, this really strong stimulus for, for short periods of time that seems to be, uh, that seems to elevate DDNF levels uh, to the greatest degree. So right. That's awesome. I'm a big fan of those, <clears throat> those specific forms of exercise. Yeah. So, cause this leads into kind of the last little bit of questioning I have here. Um, cause you're talking about the, the EEG that we talked about the QEEG, th- these sorts of things that require you to be kind of hooked up to hooked up to technology. Um, what sort of cost, and I guess you're down in the U S and I'm in Canada. So we, we, you know, it's hard to say, but if, if we comparatively speaking versus say other therapies, and, and I don't, wanna, I don't want to only say that cost is a, you know, deciding factor because value is something else. Like if you change somebody's life with a couple of sessions and the next 30 years, their life, you know, things are incredible. I'd say that's well worth it, but is this a relative, relatively expensive therapy or, or what, what would people be looking at in terms of if they were trying to get this kind of therapy? At the moment, it, it definitely is on the pricier side. I would say, I mean, it also depends if, if someone's seeking this technology through like a psychiatrist or neurologist, it could potentially be covered through insurance. Okay. Yeah. Um, but on the peak performance or wellness side of things, you know, the technology is still, you know, going to be pretty pricey at this point, just because I think even though I wouldn't say the technology is in its infancy, but this use of the technology in terms of for mm. peak performance and wellness that use of the technology is in its infancy. Right. So okay. there is a high price point, I would say right now, but it's my personal, maybe somewhat biased opinion, obviously, because I'm working with this stuff, but I think it's gonna, we're gonna just see more and more kind of places, businesses uh, pop up that, that work with these types of technologies. And I think that's gonna in turn start driving the cost down. You know, just as there gets to be a more of a, you know, more and more of a demand. So we're basically building, building better brains and in one sense, could that lead to building better humans? I think so. I mean, I, I truly think like this could be the foundation of just like creating like massive societal change. Like if we're able to improve the functioning of our brains and make it easier, like, like we're, you know, improving our social relationships because we're calmer and less reactive and, you know, we're not as argumentative because our brains are like trained and we're work, you know, functioning like, you know, calmer, more peaceful human beings. I think that like on a grand scale, it really could like change Matt, like produce massive societal change. Which is awesome. So then um, last, last bit here, because what if people want to find you, where, where do they find you? And the other part of that is because one part of it, I think has to be an in-person type like this, Again, getting hooked up to the machinery requires you to be yes. in person, but is there a way that you can work with people on their brain health remotely? Yes. So that's, I do offer neuro health coaching, which we basically utilize whatever we sort of research backed kind of neuroscientific tips and tools, whether that be nutrition, exercise, uh, sleep hygiene, uh, nootropics, like playing around with smart drugs, uh, kind of inter. Basically, I help people integrate all those different approaches in the same way that, say, an exercise trainer, you know, you might hire to to get in the best physical shape of your life. And they're going to give you a specific, you know, meal plan and exercise plan to follow. I do the same sort of thing uh, for the brain. So I sort of am a neuro trainer in that sense. So if people are interested in that, they can check out Roscoe's wetsuit neuro dot com. There's a complimentary uh, coaching consult that people can do with me and just talk with me and see if that is uh, something they want to pursue. And then people who actually are in the uh, South Florida area, uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, I do offer these uh, kind of neuromodulation services in person where I'll actually come to your door or your place of uh, your, your residence or your business and actually set you up with, uh, with these brain mapping or neurofeedback, neurostimulation sessions. So hopefully we'll, we'll be expanding, but starting, starting now, it's just going to be South Florida. Yeah. So you could basically go to businesses and say, I'll make your employees smarter and more productive. 
And there's, there's interest from CEOs who are like, yeah, I want all my employees <laughs> getting their brain mapped. Like I want to see. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think it's, it's something, yeah, there's, there's so many applications and that's just one, the, the whole like corporate wellness, I feel like is, is a whole sort of like emerging field, like yeah. component of the wellness industry. I think that this technology has a huge role to play in that. Yeah. And there could be some sort of privacy and ethical things that have to be navigated carefully as well. Um, yes. I just dropped that in there. But um, so you're also the host of a podcast, Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And, uh, you know, people are going to have to reach out to you. I I'm going to leave them hanging with the intrigue of why you named it Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro, um, because we're short on time and I want to have them to have a reason to, to reach out to you. Where else can they yes. find you? Um, you can shoot me a DM on Instagram. Uh, Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro uh, on Twitter or uh, Wetsuit Podcast. There's also a YouTube channel, uh, Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. Um, and so feel free on any of those mediums, get in touch with me, shoot me a DM, uh, leave a comment, let me know uh, what your thoughts are. If you guys have any suggestions for guests that you want on the show, besides Coach John, yeah. he, was, he was a great, great guest to maybe. 30, 20, 30 episodes ago. So we'll definitely have to have you back on the show at some point. But, Absolutely. Uh, Episode 121, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It wasn't just, too just long ago. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Check that out. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time and being on here today. It's been super interesting. I have way more questions. So we're definitely going to have, have to have you back as well. And so for anybody listening, I'd, um, I'd love for you to reach out with, with any questions you have as well. Get in touch with, with Toby. He's very easy to talk to. And this is like crazy, cool, insane, awesome technology. So um, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, this has been the Wellness Unplugged podcast. And stay tuned for more episodes coming soon. Thanks for listening to Wellness Unplugged, where we disconnect the fake glitz of social media and get real about creating that transformation you've been wanting for far too long. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show now so you're first to hear new episodes with more motivating conversations with health experts to help you take the next step on your journey of transformation. If you can't wait until then, sign up for Coach John's free Crush Your Cravings Guide to reduce nighttime snacking, eating because you're bored, and emotional eating. Get it now at freedomnutrition.rocks slash crush your cravings.